Okay. Um, hi. Um, sort of, as I posted, uh, instead of a uh, help session today, uh, I'll just try and anticipate kind of your question. So I, I was basically planning on, you know, uh, reviewing the first assignment. So, you know, going over the, um, com the general comments that I gave um, when I returned assignment one. Um, and then uh, I was going to talk about assignment two, uh, introduce you to it, um, and make certain everybody get started working on it and looking at it, thinking about it. All right. Um, and then maybe I can talk a little bit about um, one or two things about this week's and next week's sort of content thing. So I don't know. Like, like I said in my announcement, I don't know if we'll have a, um, a, a more interactive one. I'll see if I can um, set something up or not. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, if, if you guys uh, think you need it, um, or, you know, just, you can always send questions, right? So, um, I'm, I, most of my kind of general feedback, uh, like on assignment one came from interacting with students' questions and, and, uh, on the different problems and things. So, okay. So for assignment one, I posted this, uh, solution here. Um, Uh, oops, there we go. Um, I don't think I need to rerun it, so I think everything's run here. So, let me see, let me remind myself kind of some of the general comments that I had had. Um, so yeah, I mean, pretty much everybody did well. Uh, one or two students were um, kind of struggling to get uh, all the parts there, but um, almost everybody uh, that turned it in <coughs> pretty much they had most everything. Um, um, oh yeah, I, I did kind of mess up something a little bit on the first question, so um, if you look carefully on the solution that I posted, I did it slightly differently than what I asked you guys to do. So. So for a memoization, uh, basically what you normally do is you want to create a lookup table, basic, basically. Um, and the lookup table, though, should always be um, kind of globally available, you know. So, so for a, a real um, computationally expensive sort of process, this might end up being like in, in a database or something like that. And so then what you set it up, though, so it's the... the um, the solution that you guys had to do that's it's the same basic idea but um but yeah if you, if you pass it in as a dictionary i mean you still have to recalculate all the things in the dictionary but at least if you did it right you should have only had to recalculate everything once um and, and you would have gotten the pretty much the same speed up so this won't really affect the um uh, the time that you'll see if you, if you do a performance evaluation you know it should still be uh, I mean, dep this will depend on the computer that you're running on, but yeah, on my computer, it's down to hundreds of nanoseconds, 100 or 200 nanoseconds or so. So, but yeah, th th this would make a difference if you were really doing this um, using memoization technique. So if it took you like hours to compute each one of these entries that you wanted to put in a lookup table, um, if, if, you know, so, so yeah, you wouldn't have to do, you wouldn't want, want to do that even just one time, you know, you'd want to do the calculation once and then forever after reuse that as, as a lookup of the result of that calculation. So, so that's, that's really all memoization is. So, I mean, pretty much everybody had an implementation that looks something like this, that, you know, you first checked if N was in your dictionary D if for if you did it the way I asked you to do it, or, or here I just got a global dictionary that I'm using. So um, this, is, this is kind of another general comment, and this is just more about programming in general, but you know, th this is, in some sense, this is bad. So you should be aware of, and you should never use a variable that's not local to a function, you know, that's not defined inside your function or passed in as a parameter, right? Like I'm doing here, right? So a couple people did that for the, like the second function, um, you know, so in the cell before I called the iterate Julia set, just to skip ahead a bit, I had defined like columns and rows, um, and and you were using we, we don't pass in the columns and rows, but but people were using that, and that that's kind of a no no because you're expo you're you're using 
things external to your function in order for your function to work correctly. So if I don't set the columns and rows the way you're expecting, um, your function won't work, right? So it's fine to, to rely on parameters that are explicitly passed in. That forces me to, to set what needs to be set as input to your function, but you should never use other stuff normally that's not passed in as a parameter, right? So, I mean, that's, that's kind of function 101, um, or that's a little bit about functional programming. So in pure functional programming, your, your, your functions have to be completely self-contained. So if they rely on any, if, if they modify some external state or if they rely on some external state being set for them to function properly, uh, it's not a good function, right? And, and, and it could be buggy and it can expose state and things like that. So anyway. I gave a few people comments about that. So, but it's it's kind of an exception here for the the memoization technique because you explicitly need to have an external lookup table that's created and that you refer to in your function, right? Um, so that's what we're doing here. We're using a dictionary, but like I said, I mean this could be like you know. A, 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 a database that's being built or, or something like that, right, where you do a, a database query to see if, if the result you need is calculated yet or not. And, and, and yeah, here, you know, we just reuse the result. So if, if in is in the dictionary, right, um, we just skip over doing any calculation and we just look it up from the dictionary. So that's really all memoization is, right? If it's not in the dictionary, though, we have to perform the calculation, so... So that was one, and, and if you did it correctly, you know, again, whether you passed in a dictionary, so if, if you passed in a dictionary, it, you would still see the same speed up because, again, you would only be doing the calculation once instead of like it was being done on the inefficient version. So this actually causes an exponential amount of re... So the, these calculations for like um, n is 10 and 11 and 12, if, if I want to calculate 37, in, it, if you expanded out the tree that ends up happening they get they get computed recomputed many 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 times which is why it takes on the order of seconds seven or eight seconds or whatever depending on your computer rather than nanoseconds <coughs> to do the inefficient version that's 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 an example of an exponential algorithm right so it's very inefficient um all right so that was that was problem one. Um, so oh, I mean, there's some other general comments. I maybe should have started with these. So I mean, some people still quite don't understand what I meant by all the cells need to run cleanly. So actually, maybe I'll do that. Although maybe I'll comment out my inefficient version here, so I don't have to wait for these to complete. So basically, now if if you're using Jupyter Hub, there, there's actually a button right on your quick access things to rerun, restart the kernel, and rerun everything. So before you submit your assignments for this class, hit that. Check that everything actually reruns. Uh, you know, rerun it, go down, look, and if, if, if not everything runs down to your last cell, um, then you need to fix it before you submit your assignment, right? And if it does, save and upload, okay? And if it doesn't, fix it so it does run everything. So that's that's what we <clears throat> that's what we mean by everything you need to be able to rerun the notebook and everything runs cleanly. Alright. Um another general comment, uh, this is for the problem four. You need to you can't use hard coded paths like this because um well it's annoying, um and, and you need to understand you need to learn to use things uh, so that your notebooks and stuff are portable, so you need to be able to use relative kinds of um, uh, paths, um, uh, you know, living inside of a um, particular directory structure for a project or something, okay? So, so yeah, I mean, you can't hard code a, a path, you know, C colon or whatever, because I can't run your notebook unless I fix that and change it and, and give the, 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 the path on my system where your data file is, right? If, if you do the relative path correctly, it'll work because I, when I run your notebooks for grading, I will put them in an environment where the, the same relative path to data files or any other external file you need to load or something uh, has the same relative path as it does in your Jupyter notebook, right? So, so your assignments 
subdirectory is is located directly under the root of our machine learning Python class project, right? So so everything that you need for an assignment is going to be relative to the same location when I grade your notebook. So that means that you have to go up one level um, and then go into the data subdirectory if, if you need a data file or one level go up to a scripts if, if I ask you to run a script or something uh, or one level and go up to figures if you need to load a figure or save a figure. So if I ask you to save a figure into the figure subdirectory you have to go go one level up and then into figures and then save save the figure there. All right. Okay. So, so that the only place where that got people, well, the only place we had that for the first assignment was yeah, reading in the data file for the pandas problem for. But, but you, you need to specify because uh, so another thing. I mean, I I will be grading some or all of some notebooks in the future um, using some sort of a script, so some sort of automated grading. And if your submitted assignment doesn't run because of issues like that or because you didn't check it and not all cells run cleanly I mean you know I might not I might not take the time to fix it I mean I definitely probably won't change your code um, uh, it's, it's debatable whether I'll change your path to get that correct um, you know so but I definitely won't fix a cell and that that means that any cell after that you know I, I mean I can't really evaluate it that well unless I go in and fix it by hand or, or run the cells after that by hand so all right so that's that was kind of those general comments about making certain everything runs cleanly making sure you use relative paths um, I don't know I probably won't take off points if you're not following Python style but I'll probably kind of harp on you about it you know so, so there's a, a standard style so look up uh, Google Python um, pep8 style guide right? if, if you're interested in some of the details but um, um, you know certain things like um, make certain that your functions I mean I even explicitly had that as comments in your assignment instructions which tells me some people aren't reading uh, the um, um, assignments maybe as, as closely as they should um, but anyway so you know if it's a trivial function, I mean, maybe you don't have to have function documentation where, I mean, you're going to have to make a judgment call on what trivial is. If you're in doubt, just put it in. But but this is what function documentation or, or what Python doc strings are, right? And by convention, you describe the function, you describe your parameters, I mean, you describe your return value, right? So, you know, when whenever you're reading help on uh, using, like, contextual help or, or the, the built-in help system, um, I guess I'm going to have to run my uh, notebook if I want to see the help here. Uh, oh, no, I already did that. That's right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's basically a doc string like that. I mean, that's what you're getting. So you can see what kind of people that build, like, a NumPy library, right? So their doc string, again, it's, it's, it's a general description. Um, it's, it's a section for the parameters that the function um, accepts as inputs and describing what the values are, maybe what the defaults are. Um, the, the return value, and then also there's usually other stuff as well, which, you know, is not a bad thing. Like like an example usage is a good thing maybe to have on your function doc strings. And so, anyway. Um, I don't know. Some other things. I mean, I guess a big one is that all variables and functions should use camel case notation. notation. So don't use capital letters for variable names um, um, and just use an underscore to separate um, Word, words if you have a multi-word multi function name or multi-word variable name like fib underscore dict is a, is a um, multi-word variable name for the dictionary and Fibonacci efficient is a multi-word name for the function here. So. Um, and I guess maybe only the only other I'll mention is I mean be consistent on your notation so these notebooks should you know if you create like a new cell um, it, it'll indent for you using, I think it uses four spaces by default, and, and you should use the, the, the same in, indentation. All right, so, so it'll, it'll indent over using four spaces, you know, but, but, but keep that. I mean, so my comment on that was, I mean, I had people, so of course your, your code won't compile if, if you use incondis, in, inconsistent indentation, so 
Um, right? So if I try and run that, you know, we'll get an indentation error, right? But I'm going to have to have another uh, level here. So, so, I mean, some people had like four spaces, but then they were consistent, but they used two spaces then for a different indentation level. So. And then you maybe use it different for, for this level. All right. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I was even surprised that it kind of worked. Um, but um, um, so anyway, uh, yeah, so maybe that's not even supposed to work. But, but so make certain you're all using the same amount of indentation everywhere. So, so it has to be consistent for all levels. Okay. So, and, and it might not even, you know, be parsable correctly for, for Python if, if you don't do that. So, but if you find somewhere, some way that you can do that, you know, don't, you know, be consistent. So those are just kind of big kind of things on style issues that, that you should be doing. I, I don't know, I, I, again, I don't know what I consider tri trivial functions or that I can give like a solid definition of probably things like something that's just like a mathematical uh, equation that, that you need to compute a gradient on or minimize or something like that is, is trivial. You know, you don't need a doc string for that, but just as an example. Um, So yeah, most people got problem two. I guess probably the the toughest was you know kind of getting all the calculations on two, but then um, maybe having an issue or two. So yeah, I think the most common thing was, was maybe having something not quite right for the um, um, the implementation of the loop here to, to 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 do this calculation to get the fractal um, computed, uh, so you could display the pretty picture. Um, so one, I, I didn't take any points off for this, but yeah, there there had there was about making a copy. So the reason why you do that, um, and, and you know, I described this a little bit on the um, announcement here as well, but so, so we talked a little bit about this in our lecture notebook on NumPy. So for efficiency reasons, um, you know, if you don't make a copy like this, and if I keep using Z, uh, if I modify Z like we are doing here, um, I mean, Z is just going to be referring to the same bit of memory when I pass in pass it in as a parameter. So any modifications I make to Z um, after I call the iterate Julia, uh, I'll be able to see those changes in Z now, you know, after we return from this function, which you may not want, right? So, so you, may, you may not you may want your Z to still be the same it is. So, for example, somebody had a bug where they had called iterate Julia set, and then for some reason they had copied it and called it again here um, into the the uh, function be just before they plotted it, um, uh, like here. So, so let me show you the fact. Hopefully, this will work here. Uh, I didn't try this out beforehand, but um, basically, since Z gets gets changed, if you call it once and call it again, you actually end up iterating twice the number. So you iterate 256 times the first time, and I iterate another 256 times here, since I'm going to be passing in the result of C after the first 200 Z after the first 256 iterations. All right, that's if you don't do the copy. All right, so if I rerun that, take out the copy. Um, define my Z using the, the tiling like you did in, in problem two, but it's, it's bigger. It's 480 by 320 columns and rows. And we call iterate, and then we try and plot our figure. Um, you know, basically, iterating for 512 causes a lot more of the points to drop out of the, the, uh, the Julia fractal set at this point. So, so, um, so, so yeah, it looks like something's gone wrong. Um, but really, it really hasn't gone wrong. It's just we end up iterating tw 
twice there. So if I only called iterate once before I did it, you'll get the... Um, so I, I re-ran this cell to re-get Z fresh, and then I, I called it, right? But you can see how, how the, that, that affected without the copy. So, you know, but, and, and this is, I mean, this is a little bit of a trick, but I just use, reuse the same name, but by calling copy, now the Z I use after this point um, is, is going to be working on the, the copy. So a, anything I do in here won't change the, the, the Z that the caller gave to me as input to the function, right? Which means I can, I should be able to safely call it multiple times, um, and, and I'm, I'm still only going to get 256 iterations, right, because I'm not affecting my Z out here inside of my function. So. All right. So that was what that copy was. But like I said, I didn't really take off points for that. So, so if you look at my switch, I mean, there, there's certainly lots of ways to do this. Um, I mean, my only general comment was, you know, so it's... If you use like np.where or um, some of the other functions for working with a mask, um, I'm drawing a blank on the name now, but, you know, so, so you can get it to work. But, um, you know, I, I think that to me, if you just directly use the mask uh, inside of a square parenthesis, so whenever I have a Boolean mask, I just directly apply it. So as long as M is the same shape as Z, but M is, is an array of Booleans of the same shape, I, I can just read expressions like this, of like, you know, Z where M is true equals Z where M is true squared plus C where M is true, right? So, so again, when, when you do the mask, you'll only select a subset of the values and you'll square those, and this will only select a subset of the values of C. The, the, those two should be the same size, Right, so I'll be able to add those together, and then that same size will be the same size as ZM on the left-hand side that I assign the results into. And, and so the effect was I'll only be updating the values in Z where M is true here, right? So. All right. Um, yep, so that was problem three. Um, and you can look over kind of my example code, right? So, oh, I, another thing here, I had a couple of people, I guess I, I guess I need to update this question. Um, so when I, uh, when I said timestamp, um, uh, you know, at least three or four, you know, we're thinking like a real timestamp, which actually, to my surprise, kind of works. So the only, the only thing you really need, is lo as long as these values in T are increasing, you know, so, so um, if, if, um, if the, the mask is no longer true, it stops uh, uh, increasing uh, right at that point, right? So it doesn't matter, but, but uh, the, the simplest way is just to think of this as like an integer time index. So, so time goes 0, 1, 2, 3, and then you just stamp that with, with your integer time index. And, and so 0 were all the points that fell out immediately, and then things with the slightly lighter color fell out at iteration 2, 3, or 4, or whatever, right? And the things with the brightest color were still there at iteration 256 or so um, on this fractal calculation here. Um, all right, yeah, so that was all my general comments. Um, yeah, I think most everybody got the pandas, um, although only, yeah, I mean, about half of you all did the extra credit too, which I gave a point to, although, um, I probably took off the point, um, you know, so you might have only got 100 even if you did the extra credit because of, of, a thing like, uh, I don't know, like basically not getting everything perfect. Um, like maybe not necessarily the copy, but some other little things here or there. So anyway, um, yeah, for, for that sorting, in my example solution, I actually create a new view into the pandas data frame. So I just uh, pull out those things and then so you, you can you can uh, call um, a function sort by sort values to, to sort by a particular so sort all of the data by one particular row, for example, like total, and then plot them. 
but yeah, these, these little plotting functions are useful uh, against a data frame for, for doing quick and dirty sorts of things, you know, so. So yeah, I didn't really consider it correct if you didn't um, use the, uh, the, 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 the pandas plot, but try to plot a bar plot by hand, right? Although I probably only took like a, a point or two off, so, if any. Um, but yeah, most everybody had kind of all the other pandas data frame stuff. Um, so what can I say kind of to wrap up on, on assignment one? So, you know, I, I think how quickly, you know, how, how smoothly you'll be able to do the, the things um, in the next parts of the class, the next weeks and stuff, will kind of depend on how well you are, are, are understanding Doing vectorized calculations and 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 uh, doing kind of these more advanced sort of slicing with arrays and things like that. Okay, so so we make heavy use of that for all kinds of stuff. And the the way that we normally implement our machine learning algorithms using gradient descent and stuff like that, we, we use um, a, a linear algebra form formalization or formula, uh, which we can directly represent as a NumPy array, and then we can perform vectorized calculations on that to do things like calculate gradients and stuff. So, so yeah, um, you know, you'll have to kind of be pretty comfortable with this at some point, because uh, you'll see it kind of over and over again um, to, um, in order to quickly understand the material, you know, so. So if you're still not quite there yet, uh, you'll get more and more, you'll get a lot more practice on, on doing NumPy arrays and shaping them and, uh, slicing them and doing calculations with them and stuff like that. Um, all right, and then let me, so, uh, oh, assignment two is now posted, so I'll just say a few words about this, uh, but uh, but you've have, you have got two weeks, so, but you should get started working on it this week. Um, so um, actually, there are some other assignments three through seven out there, but but yeah, it's, it's you shouldn't look at any of the assignments kind of ahead of time because I am changing all these, so I don't know if any of these are going to stay the same. So uh, and another thing is is you probably do have to do a git poll, okay? So um, so you know I've updated notebooks and I've updated this assignment, so you need to change to your repository. And do a git poll. So if you don't see the assignment two, like I have it here, so it should be assignment two on scikit-learn stats model. Uh, and if you don't see that, you know, open up a terminal on your uh, host machine and, and, and get into your repository and do a git poll. That should bring you up to date. If you have a if you have a conflict on there, you'll have to like delete the file that's in conflict um, or do like a git restore on it possibly maybe making a copy of the file before you do that if you might have something in there that you want to keep so all right but yeah make make certain that that um, the one you before you begin working on it is the assignment two for the scikit learn basics doing regression classification and it has a, a due date of 918 which is basically the end of our fourth week here so not this week but the week after this right so I don't know um, I think think people will find this less time intensive than the first one um, but um, but I don't know we'll see so basically for week three and four um, we are kind of taking a high level picture of so you're gonna learn a little bit about using the scikit-learn framework for doing machine learning um, and then later on we're gonna go back and kind of dig into the details of, of the machine learning algorithms that that we want to understand better um, as a result of taking this class. Um, but, but yeah, for this week, week three, we look at like an end-to-end -end example of a data analytics pro, um, process or workflow. So, um, so for this week's video lectures, um, we go through looking at like data exploration and then data cleaning um, and then once we get to that point you know we, we've set up the data in such a way that we can start beginning doing machine learning training and modeling on it okay so kind of as a secondary thing though the the example that we use in week three is an example of a regression problem okay so at this point you should have read chapter one and and watched maybe the the dr nigg's um, um, 
Dr. Ings, sorry, I always want to mispronounce his name, Dr. Ings, um, machine learning videos, the, the first ones where we cover the same kind of thing. So we talk about uh, the, the, the main flavors of machine learning. So there's supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Uh, and there's a couple of others, um, but, uh, but we'll look at supervised and unsupervised learning in this class. Um, you know, semi-supervised and um, um, uh, some other variations. So within supervised learning, which we spend probably about two thirds of the class talking about supervised learning, there's there's two different types that, that you have to treat slightly differently. So there's regression problems and classification problems. Okay, regression regression problems for supervised learning is the output you want to predict is a real valued number. Okay, so we use like house price data here and a couple of other times uh, with different data sets, but with with housing prices. So, so we're trying to give them information about a house, like its location and its size and square feet. We want to pick, predict the house price. Or actually in the example for week three here from chapter two, and sorry about the numbering, but um, so when I refer to our units, I do them by unit number one, two, three, but uh, here I, I keep the, the chapter number because um, I think that's, so these are, these are the hands-on machine learning chapter two, um, videos and I split into three parts. So so yeah we're working with uh, housing data so for um, our chapter two we're actually trying to predict kind of the average house price in um, a data set of some California districts or, or you know uh, counties or, or whatever in California. So. And then the other flavor of, of, of supervised learning are classification problems. So in that case, what you're trying to predict is a label. It's a discrete label. So the simplest classification problems are binary classification. So you might want to predict whether, like if you're trying to build an email, email classifier, whether it's a, a spam email or a ham email, which is a, a funny term for a good email that, that has real data rather than spammy you know, advertisement. Um, so anyway, and so it's kind of as a secondary goal, like like this first week, you know, we, we, we look at the scikit-learn machine learning framework um, and give an example of an end-to-end -end through data exploration and cleaning, kind of a big picture view, but we also work with regression problems. And then um, our next unit, from chap which goes over chapter three, we look at a class at classification problem. Um, and more and learn more about the scikit learn framework. So, so this week and next week and your assignment, uh, we're trying to learn about the, the scikit learn um, uh, framework. So some, some ideas about it, um, how you use it to fit and train models um, and other things, right? So yeah, for assignment four, like uh, assignment two, sorry, um, basically, like I said, I think it won't be um, as time intensive as, as assignment one, we'll see. But I, I ask you to perform a linear regression on a set of data. It's, a, it's another set of housing data. I should probably find some different data sets, maybe. But um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I ask you, you have to you have to load it in. Make sure you load it in using a relative path name um, and uh, use scikit-learn. So, so you'll basically be doing the same kinds of things that we showed in the video, but uh, applying it to this different data set to fit a regression and. Um, do some prediction and find the scores and parameters from it. So, um, I do um, also ask you to redo the regression using stats model and also to redo the, the classification using stats model. Um, I've only got one video on this, so I kind of I, I suggest for um, this week probably to me that the best um, the best plan would be to. Um, Watch the three videos and work through the three uh, Jupyter notebooks um, and, and read our textbook. Start with that, right? And then secondly, I've got like a fourth video um, where um, I kind of summarize using the scikit learning framework, and I also talk about using the stats model library. So you might want to watch that then. And at that point, you might want to start working on assignment two, or at least see if you can do the regression um, part, you know, so our first week is kind of about regression here, and the, our, our, our unit three is about re regression um, and the scikit-learn framework. 
So maybe do this first part where we do a regression um, model, um, and and then you know watch the video with the stats model and try and do the the stats model stuff for you know with a linear regression. All right. And then um, you know so that gets you kind of about halfway through the assignment, and then maybe next week. Um, you know, watch the two videos I have on um, classification from Chapter 3 of our Hands-On Machine Learning textbook, right? Um, um, and then, you know, you can either watch the video again or, or maybe you don't need to watch it again. Um, but, but this kind of has a summary, again, also of Scikit-Learn, so, so it overlaps with this unit and, and the next unit. Uh, but yeah, at that point, then then you can go back to the assignment um, and do the the second part where we ask you to do a classifier, a binary classifier on a set of data. So. Um, all right. So I think that that was the kind of the stuff. I mean, that, that was the stuff I was going to go over. Uh, I was planning on going over in our help session. Um, Sands questions that, that I, don't, I don't know if students have. So feel free to send me your questions uh, if you have them about the past assignment or getting started on assignment two. Um, if, if we need to, like I, like I said, I'll, I'll see, I'm, I'm not certain I can make some time to uh, have an interactive session, um, but if a lot of people ask for it, we'll, we'll see what we can do here. Um, or, you know, send questions, I'll gather those and, and kind of maybe answer those as a separate um, um, follow-up video for semi-interactive sort of help session. So. All right, so that's it for this video, um, and I will see you guys uh, at our next help session or whenever.